A woman sits in a narrow cell, draped in a red kimono. She holds her pen awkwardly, having never quite gotten the hang of calligraphy as a child, but nevertheless, she writes. After all, Fumiko knows her death is coming. She has just confessed to a plot to kill Crown Prince Hirohito, the soon-to-be Emperor of Japan. She isn't afraid to die. Her confession was swift, enthusiastic, and as she would later admit, she had in fact exaggerated her own role in the plot to ensure this fate for herself. But now, asked to explain her actions, she takes the time she has to write down the whole story, every experience that shaped her into the kind of woman who would think to commit such an act of treason. And she has every intention of using this opportunity to the fullest, to call attention to the injustices of Japan's authoritarian society at all levels, from the state, to the economy, to the family. Before this point, she has always been forced to moderate her own writing to avoid the imperial censors, but now, safe in the knowledge that nothing she wrote could be used against her, she freely writes what she believes, and the scandalous details of the life story which shaped her. Kaneko Fumiko was born in the Japanese city of Yokohama. The official record of her birth, written years after the fact, claims she was born on January 25, 1902, but her parents instead gave a date of July 23, 1903. This discrepancy is something Fumiko would later note as a small example of the fallibility of the state. Fumiko was born out of wedlock to Saiki Fumikazo and Kaneko Kikuno, a man from a samurai family and the daughter of peasants, respectively. Ever since the Meiji Restoration, households had been required to register all their members at a local government office. As her parents were not officially married, Fumiko was not registered as a member of her father's family, but her father's pride kept her from being registered as an illegitimate child of her mother either. As such, Fumiko remained unregistered for the first eight years of her life. Without registration, a person's opportunities and rights were severely curtailed, as a registration certificate was required to enroll in school or gain work. Although this fact would come to haunt Fumiko later on, as a small child it made little difference to her. Although her family was fairly poor, Fumiko reported that this period of her life was a happy one. Her earliest memories, from when she was around four years old, revolved around being doted on by Fumikazo, who at the time worked as a police detective. She remembered him taking her to the public baths, fussing over styling her hair and eyebrows and the fit of her clothes, and carefully attending to her when she was sick. Despite their poverty, Fumi noted, her father acted as though nothing had changed from his own affluent childhood in a samurai family, pampering his daughter as he'd been pampered. The happy years didn't last though. At some point, Fumiko's father seems to have started a behavioral down spiral, though some of it might have just been a side of him Fumi hadn't witnessed at age four. He started drinking, openly engaging in affairs, and physically abusing Kikuno. Somewhere along the line, he had lost his job with the police, and while Fumiko was never sure what he was doing instead, he spent less and less time in the house, sometimes coming back in the middle of the night drunk. On one occasion, Fumiko recalled being dragged along by her mother to retrieve him from a brothel, and on another occasion from a card game, after which he brutally beat Kikuno on the street for embarrassing him, requiring Fumi to run for help to stop him before he killed her. He would eventually begin an affair with Kikuno's sister and run off to marry her, abandoning Fumi, Kikuno, and Fumi's baby brother Ken. Kikuno would spend the next few years drifting between relationships with men who could help support her and Fumi, but who were often similarly unsavory figures to Fumiko's father, with her inevitably leaving them when they became too abusive or neglectful. Fumiko went through quite a bit of abuse at the hands of Kikuno's first new boyfriend, including being deprived of food, rolled up in a quilt and locked in a closet, and at one point being left tied up in a bundle hanging from a tree, though it was only when he stole Fumiko's school funds to go out drinking that her mother finally left him. During this period, the family was in dire poverty. Kikuno had to send Ken to live with Fumiko's father, and at one point even contemplated selling Fumi to a brothel owner, though she gave up on this plan after learning that Fumiko would be sent too far away for her to visit. Oftentimes, they missed meals for entire days, and at one point Fumi recalls eating burnt rice out of a garbage heap in the street just to ease her hunger. Fumiko's one respite during this period was school. Fumiko loved school, being both an intelligent student who performed well in a variety of subjects, and a lonely kid in need of friends. Although she had to miss classes whenever she needed something like a new notebook to allow her mother time to save up, she managed to keep up, being quite academically skilled despite her circumstances. However, one looming issue was her registration status. As an unregistered youth, she wasn't technically allowed to attend, and while her mother was able to convince principals to let her attend classes, she wasn't able to collect report cards or graduation certificates. Fumiko's life changed again when Kikuno and her then-boyfriend, who Fumi calls Kobayashi in her memoirs, managed to save up enough money to move to Kobayashi's home village in the mountains of Yamanashi Prefecture. When Fumi's family arrived, there were no houses available for them, but the villagers decided to clean up an old abandoned woodshed for them to live in. The building had fallen into serious disrepair, 
with rotting floorboards and a leaky roof, but with some new boards, a fresh coating of mud-based plaster on the walls, straw stuffed into the cracks, and a hole cut into the floor to install a hearth, it became livable. Even with the repairs, it was quite a ramshackle living arrangement, without even a door and with no way to completely keep the snow out during the winter, but they were able to make do. In her memoirs, Humi described the village in some depth. It consisted of 14 or 15 families, all of them related to each other in one way or another. Situated to the south of a high mountain, the village got plenty of sunlight, and gardens carved into the side of the mountain were used to grow barley and vegetables to provide some of the food the villagers needed. Although the local diet was fairly simple, consisting mostly of coarse rice mixed with barley, unseasoned vegetables, and occasionally heavily salted fish, the villagers were kept healthy by supplementing their diets with fruits and nuts gathered from the mountainside. Fumiko credited life in the village with giving her an abiding love of nature, from foraging in the mountains and passing through the woods each day on the path to school. She described village life as an ideal way of living, healthy and close to nature. And yet, she also saw deep issues within the village. One of her central criticisms was what she saw as the corrupting influence of money. Although they were able to grow and forage some of their food, the villagers were not fully self-sufficient, being unable to produce their own clothes and growing no rice of their own. In order to fill their needs, therefore, the village needed to buy goods from traders in what Fumiko identified as an unequal exchange. Its primary industry during the spring and summer was silkworm cultivation, for which mulberry bushes were grown in the gardens. In winter, the men of the village would go into the mountains to manufacture charcoal, the largest source of income for the village. Traders would visit from cities, buying charcoal and silkworm cocoons, before turning around to sell clothes, rice, and other goods. While Fumi argued that a village which produced so much silk should be able to clothe all of its residents in fine clothing, instead, the silkworm cocoons were sold to buy striped cotton country clothes, worth far less than the silk cloth that would ultimately be made from the cocoons. Fumiko further described how the traveling salesmen were masters of advertisement and bargaining, skillfully convincing village women that they had to buy expensive items. As such, Fumi described how the wealth was perpetually drained from the countryside, as the meager money earned through selling raw materials was quickly spent on manufactured goods brought in from the cities. In this, she described a relationship between the cities and countryside noticeably similar to the one between imperial powers and their colonies. Fumi also identified issues with the internal economics of the village. While money was rarely used within the village, monetary value was still recognized, with transactions being filled with barter. In order to buy anything they needed for school, children had to carry heavy bags loaded with charcoal to the store. Additionally, Fumi saw a certain level of corruption within the village. While her teacher had warmly welcomed her into school, and promised her a certificate despite her unregistered status, claiming that things were done differently in the countryside, she was left humiliated when the certificate was publicly refused to her because her mother hadn't presented a gift of sake to the teacher. Afterwards, Kikuno apologized and promised to go to the teacher with sake to get Fumiko the certificates she'd worked for, but Fumi refused. She'd already been humiliated, and refused to give the teacher his satisfaction. Several days after this event, Kikuno's brother arrived in the village. Kikuno, miserable in her poor circumstances, had written to him on their first new year in the village, hoping her family would sweep in to help her, but deep snow had kept him from coming. When he finally reached them, however, Kikuno greeted him with tears of joy, and he invited the family to accompany him back to Fumiko's grandparents. After her time in the village, Fumi moved in with her mother's parents, while her mother remarried and went to live with her new husband, leaving Fumiko feeling abandoned just as when her father had left. During this time, they received a visit from Fumiko's paternal grandmother, Mutsu. Mutsu lived in the Japanese colony of Korea with Fumiko's aunt. Her wealth showed in both her fine clothes and on her face, which Fumi described as healthier looking than her other grandmothers, despite both women being of similar age. Mutsu explained that her second youngest daughter had struggled to have children, and that when Fumiko was three or four, she'd made an agreement with Fumikazo that if she weren't able to have any kids of her own, she would adopt Fumiko instead. The plan had frozen when Fumikazo and Kikuno had separated, as the family had lost track of Fumiko's location. But after she'd come to live with Kikuno's family, it was resurrected. Mutsu presented Fumi with luxurious clothes of silk and satin, and promised her and her family that in Korea, she would never be forced to do anything she didn't want to, and would be given anything she desired. She further promised to send Fumi to school, and said that if she graduated as expected, she'd go to a girl's high school, and from there be sent to college in Tokyo, at which point she'd see them once again. It seemed clear to the family that Fumiko's life in Korea would be far better than anything they could give her, so it was quickly agreed that she would be sent with Mutsu, after one little problem was sorted out. Fumiko's unregistered status would threaten the standing of her father's family, so to hide her illegitimate birth, she was registered as the youngest daughter of her maternal grandparents. With this, she accompanied Mutsu back to Korea, 
sent off on a clear day with the blessings and joyful tears of all her family members. And that's where we're going to leave this one. I had hoped to cover Fumiko's entire life in a single video, but due to length and time constraints, I had to split this one up into several parts. Next time, we'll cover Fumiko's life in Korea. If you're watching this before that one's out, consider checking out my Women's History Month video from last year on another Japanese anarchist, Ito Noe, in the meantime. And subscribe so that you don't miss part two. Thanks for watching everybody, and I'll see you next time.